Nice to see all of you here for the first lecture of this season. Um, Art Matters has moved to a different time slot, and I'm hoping that uh, more people will be able to make it, uh, especially those of us who um, still work, unfortunately, such as myself. Um, but um, I'm particularly pleased to be able to introduce um, someone who I think is an old friend to many of you um, and kind of a local hero, um, uh, Herbert M. Cole, Professor Skip Cole, as we know him and love him. And um, he is a retired professor emeritus from UCSB, where he taught for 35 years. Um, and of course, he's incredibly accomplished. He's published uh, very, very copiously throughout his career, including 11 books. Uh, he's received many awards, including a lifetime achievement honor from the Arts Council of the African Studies Association. Uh, he's done field research on southeastern Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Cote d'Ivoire, and has organized many exhibitions for museums, um, such as LACMA, the Smithsonian, and the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm going to let him have as much time as possible to speak tonight because he's drawing from one of his recent publications, a book that was published in 2016 called The Milk of Knowledge, Mothers and Children in African Art, which was published back in 2016, yeah. And I think it's available in our um, museum store as well if you'd like to purchase a copy. And then in closing, I should have introduced myself in case you don't know who I am, although I think most of you already do. My name is Ike Kang, and I'm the deputy director and chief curator here at the museum. And uh, we're very happy. Um, Michelle West, who worked so hard to put this series together with me, we managed to get the whole schedule um, pre-planned for the entire year. So you will be able to find online the lectures. They're all first Thursdays, and they're at 5.30. And next week's lecture will be delivered by Chris Hallett, who comes back to us from UC Berkeley, and will be speaking about mummies with painted portraits portraits from Roman Egypt and personal commemoration at the tomb. So without further ado, um, this is Skip. And if you want to hold your questions until the end, uh, that would be great. And I'm sure he'd welcome them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ike. I appreciate it. And thank all of you for coming. I very much appreciate that. And I got my jacket on about two minutes ago, and I'm going to take it off right now <laughs> because it's warm. And I lost my notes for about half an hour, and thankfully Shelley was able to uh, uncover them where they were hidden in the car. <laughs> um, Our Tom, Tom and Linda are here, okay. I had hoped to have the museum co-sponsor this talk with African Women Rising, which is an NGO formed by Tom Cole, my son, and his wife, Linda, about 13, 14 years ago in Uganda. And I want you to know about African Women Rising because it serves something like 5,000 plus women and children. 15,000. 15,000 now, okay, good, better still. Kids. And 15, okay, okay. Now, uh, the book that I'm going to, to um, try to give you an overview of today is a dry academic thing. Uh, lots of pretty pictures. But the work that African Women Rising does, and these people do, the staff and, and Linda and Tom, is on the ground work for women and children at risk, refugees from war, they do microfinancing, they do uh, uh, health, it, deal with health issues, with agriculture, with literacy, and many other things as well. And I just kind of wanted to, to co-sponsor uh, this talk with a museum and African Women Rising, but the museum doesn't co-sponsor. So they said no. <laughs> so I'm co-sponsoring African Women Rising. Um, 
I don't think this auditorium existed 50 years ago when I gave <clears throat> my first talk for Penny Knowles uh, docents at the museum exact, almost exactly 50 years ago this month. Um, and I've spoken here a number of times since. I want to give an overview of maternity imagery and its associated ideas and concepts and contexts in Africa. Even though most of the works that you're going to see tonight are regrettably not in Africa anymore. Uh, the changes that have happened in the last oh, 50, 60, 70 years and the growth of interest in African sculpture and other arts as art forms, <coughs> dealers have gone in and made offers that people can't refuse and most of the things that you're going to see tonight are in European or American collections. Uh, Africa, of course, has become urbanized to some considerable extent, but there's still a very strong village culture and children are still exceptionally important to African women. <coughs> Now, if I can get this thing to work properly. Okay, good. We're starting off well. <coughs> 53 years ago, on my very first field trip in Nigeria, eastern Nigeria, among the Igbo people, I drove a VW bus with my high school roommate, and we encountered this spectacular sculpture architectural uh, monument filled with, I think, 43 sculptures made in sun-dried mud, actually in anthill clay, as you'll see in a second. This is an Mbari house, and it's dedicated to major deities once every generation or two in major uh, communities within about a 30-mile radius of the town of Oweri in southeastern Nigeria. It's a, it's a small segment of Igbo country, um, maybe a fifth of Igbo land builds these houses as sacrifices to major deities and particularly to the goddess of the earth, whose name is Allah or Great Allah, Alauku, Great Allah. And she is found central, let's see, do I have a pointer? I do. Central on the front side with two children and, of course, six or seven living people here um, looking at the Ambari with me in 1966. I ended up writing dissertation on these structures and their complex building process, which involves sometimes a year and a half of activity on the part of carefully selected individuals another image of Allah in a different Ambari on the left, an anthill clay, and all the sculptures are made out of anthill clay, which is a numinous sub, uh, uh, substance. And anthills, these huge, tall anthills that can grow to six, seven, eight, nine feet in the air, are the places through which ancestral spirits reincarnate into uh, the wombs of women about to give birth. <coughs> Spirits emerge from anthills, and it's this spirit clay dug from deep within the anthill is modeled by men and women and uh, modeled into figures by professional artists, as you see here. And there can be as many as 150 figures in an Ambari house. Figures of everyday life, of animals, of things heard about, historical scenes, uh, things hoped for, such as a maternity clinic and so forth. Here on the right, we have Mamiwata. And upstairs in the second story, which you can see the legs of over here, uh, based on a European two-storied house, is the sun, moon, and rainbow. And in fact, the Imbari house is a recreation of the community. 
and with the sun, moon, and rainbow, it becomes a cosmic symbol, a symbol of regeneration, and Allah, uh, the goddess of the earth, <clears throat> is the recipient of these sacrifices. I should also mention that termites, or the white ants that inhabit these termite hills, these ant hills, <clears throat> the queen termite can give birth to as many as 13 million eggs in a single year. So she is a font of fertility and productivity, and she's a metaphor for the productivity of the fields and of people. Allah, goddess of the earth, gave birth to the other deities in Igbo uh, country, to all the rest of the uh, deities, to plants, to animals, and to human beings. She is the font of morality. She is the author of tradition. She is a central cultural icon in the worldview of Igbo people. So, this Mbari that we just looked at, this one, was my first encounter with a critically important maternity image in West Africa. And I have continued to be interested in this subject. And about 20 years ago, Susan Vogel published a book with a quotation from a French anthropologist saying that ancient mother, a mythological creator deity among the Sanufo people of Cote d'Ivoire, and head of the Poro initiation in Sanufo country. Initiation, of course, is the schooling of young men at, and of women, but the women hive off early in the initiation process. But the, women, the men stay in the initiation period for three, six and a half year uh, uh, stints, though not continuously. And it is ancient mother who nourishes them with the milk of knowledge. And for a while, as Ike pointed out in her introduction, this was the title of the book, but I abandoned that as a, a little too cryptic. So the book is now simply called Maternity, Mothers and Children in the Arts of Africa. So there's ancient mother uh, on the left and a Sanufo woman suckling her own child. Here is uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast in West Africa. Then about three years ago, I encountered the Red Monastery in Egypt, 14th century uh, uh, monastery in Egypt, here uh, on the Mediterranean. And a prayer was recorded from a wealthy uh, Christian family, Coptic Christian family, which you can read. We wish that you would deign to give us a little milk from your breast so that we might drink it and never die. For we have riches in abundance and innumerable possessions, but no one to inherit them. In other words, Mary's milk will grant them immortality. So with Allah, the Igbo goddess of the earth, with ancient mother, with Mary, mother of Christ, we have three different cultural manifestations of mothers and children, which are entirely different one from the next. And this is what one encounters in and across Africa. We don't really normally think of maternity as having a culture of its own, but it does. And these cultures vary enormously from place to place and from time to time, historically. An alabaster sculpture about 16, 17 inches in height in the Brooklyn Museum of Agnes Marie and Pepe II, a, an emperor in 2288 BC to 2224 BC. And he 
was made Pharaoh at the age of six, where we see him on his regent mother's lap. And Agnes Marie and Pepe II are often conflated with the exceptionally important and prominent Egyptian deity Isis. And her brother or son, Horus, depending on who you read, uh, Isis, in other words, these historical figures are conflated with the deity Isis and her son or brother Horus. She then is a queen, queen mother and the, uh, she's responsible for the annual flooding of the Nile. She's responsible for bringing marriage to Egyptian families, people, uh, weaving. Um, she was a magician, an herbalist, uh, and uh, she reigned as an exceptionally important mother goddess for uh, more than 3,000 years. Then in Ethiopia, we have an early 15th century image, somewhat damaged by a known artist of uh, Mary with her beloved son, Jesus Christ, and a 17th century uh, icon of Mary suckling the Christ child on the left. Now, Fray Seon was commissioned to make paintings for Ethiopian Orthodox churches by the Emperor Zara Yaqob, who reigned in the mid 15th century and who actually unified the, the Egyptian Coptic Church, uh, Orthodox Christian Church, by virtue of the cult of Mary. And the cult of Mary was even more important than Jesus Christ. Zari Yaqob decreed that there would be an altar to Mary in every church, and there are thousands of churches in Ethiopia and probably were even in certainly hundreds and hundreds in the 15th century. Uh, passages from the 100 Miracles of Mary had to be read at every service, every church service. People were to wear images of Christ or Mary. Um, and there were numerous stipulations that helped to unify his em empire by virtue of this cult that he insisted that everybody um, worship and pay attention to. <clears throat> so Mary was the mother of, of God, the mother of Christ, was more important in 15th century Ethiopia than was Christ himself. Um, and she was worshiped and, and was credited with magical properties. She, she uh, cried real tears, she bled real blood, so it was believed and so forth. Uh, and people worshiped her um, abundantly, one might say. We'd go back in time, and this uh, time we're in Mali, in West Africa, in the inland delta region of the Niger River, and the great bend of the Niger, for terracottas that have been unearthed mostly illegally by pot hunters, and dating to between the 11th and 17th centuries AD. There is an abnormal number of mother and child images or images of women, clearly women, with adult miniatures that we can call children. For example, here we have two, for two people clamoring up uh, this woman's chest, but one of them wears a beard. <laughs> What's interesting about these terracottas, there, there are lots of things that are in, there's a whole chapter in the book devoted to them. Um, what's interesting is not only are the, uh, the uh, 
so-called children miniature adults, which is not infrequent in the art of Africa. But even though a woman is highly diseased, as is this woman, probably with smallpox, somewhat exaggerated, she is cradling and suckling a child as if there were nothing wrong, which I find fascinating. Many of these images are, uh, have snakes adorning them variously, um, some of them with lots and lots of snakes. Uh, and somehow, and snakes were sacred, undoubtedly sacred in that period, although, of course, we don't have any historical records, records that go back that far, at least no written records. We do have the Sunjata myth, uh, which has been passed down orally and certainly started way back uh, in time, probably as early as the 14th or 15th century. We're not sure how these images were used, whether they were medicinal. Uh, some of them undoubtedly represented heroes, quite possibly deities of one kind or another. Some of them were probably medicinal uh, because disease figures very strongly in many of them. Uh, but we don't know their context. They must have been in shrines uh, or, and they themselves may have been altars. It's, it's hard to know. I had some water, but it's disappeared. It's evaporated. <laughs> Did I leave it down there? Bottle of water? No, okay. <clears throat> anyway, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of these images and as I mentioned, an abnormally large number of mother and child images. So obviously the maternity was important to these folks. We're still in Mali now. We're in Dogon country, as many of you know. Uh, and I show you three different styles of Dogon sculpture. And Dogon sculpture is radiocarbon dated uh, back into the 15th and 16th century. So. This is the same general region as the inland delta, the terracottas that we just looked at, and sometimes the styles are quite similar. So here we have three different styles of Dogon sculpture, radically different one from the next. A fairly naturalistic one on the left, a almost abstract one in the center here, uh, but obviously clearly recognizable, and then on the right, a very, very highly stylized and conventionalized one, almost looking as though uh, pipes were fitted together rather than uh, re representations of human flesh. So here's the child uh, on its mother's back, and here is her skinny arm. Her skinny, look, the knees are great um, <laughs> protuberances. And she's wearing not a beard, but a labrette in her lip. Although there are many hermaphroditic uh, images among the Dogon. <clears throat> the Dogon live in a spectacular landscape represented here above and alongside and climbing up the walls of the 1,000 foot cliff, the Bandiagara escarpment and they also live in the plain below. Now we're in Bamana country, southwest of the Dogon, and we're looking at images made for the Guan cult, which was a cult, um, a, an organization, I think we should call it, a, an association of blacksmiths who were the sculptors of these images. And we have in the shrines um, a male and female figure. Oh, thank you, Ike. Um, it's great, appreciate it. That's good. Oh, no, that's good, that's fine. Um, and the 
The, the organization is about prosperity, productivity of the fields, the fertility and productivity of human beings. Um, these figures are brought out from their uh, storage house, which I think we could call a shrine. Uh, I'm not quite sure they are deities per se. Uh, Kate Ezra, who's, who wrote the, the uh, best monograph on these things, doesn't want to call them deities. But um, another Bamana sculptor, uh, sorry, scholar does call them deities, so it's one of these problematic things nobody's quite sure. But there's a balance and reciprocity between the male figure here and the female figure, although our emphasis, of course, today is on the female. And this is a, a highly eroded mother and child, and these are large sculptures. They're uh, three and a half, four, maybe sometimes even, you know, usually only about four feet, four and a half sometimes in height, big sculptures. Now what's interesting is that blacksmiths, of course, smelt iron. And they have furnaces where uh, iron ore is burnt to become slag. Those furnaces are female. And the bloom that comes out of the bottom of the furnace and which becomes iron and steel is the child of the female uh, uh, oven. The male and female figures are associated with Bamana thought as fadenya and badenya, father childness and mother childness. And which is kind of a Jungian concept. Every human being has some of both. And father childness is about moving away from the hearth, going, venturing forth to protect the people, to trade for, uh, for warfare, for, for um, gathering herbs and medicines in the bush and so forth. Mother childness is about nurture and coming together and bringing the uh, family and the community in. So there is a play between these two ideas. And the uh, female figure here, well, this one doesn't. Sometimes she wears a dagger on one of her arms. She may have the dagger on the right arm that's not showing. And this is an indication of the component of fadenya or father childness that she uh, that that uh, is part of her being. So that we have in most African cultures a an active reciprocity between men and women, but there are some, and I'm emphasizing them, of course, today, uh, that dwell especially on the mother and her children. For example, Ahmad Yoha among the Igbo is a kind of, considered a kind of husband to Allah, but he is a much lesser deity. And Allah is the one who is truly worshiped and, and is the kind of the center of a whole series of cultural ideas that are important to the people. Ahmad Yoha is the god of thunder and lightning, he is the rain that fertilizes the earth, so that you see that reciprocity <coughs> playing out. Whoop, 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 whoop. Got to go back. We are now in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as you see in the small map. Uh, in the center of the screen. At, and we're looking at a roof finial which stands guard, announces and serves as a warning for the house of uh, a very, very important chief. There are only half a dozen or eight of these extremely important chiefs among the Eastern Pende peoples in DRC. 
So we have a mother who holds a weapon in her right hand and cradles a child in her right hand. And this figure sits atop the center pole, which goes down to what is referred to as the stomach of the chief's house. And the stomach is the inner sanctum where his most sacred items of regalia are kept. And only he and one or two very important priests are allowed in that inner sanctum. And there is a kind of hierarchy of spaces going toward that inner sanctum. And it is uh, very important because underneath the center pole, in the stomach of the house, are buried all the seeds that are grown in this community. When the house is opened at the installation of the chief, the, uh, the, the priest uh, who has been given this weapon intones this prayer which I'm going to read for you, because I can't remember it. You are the center pole of the house. You are the village with its people, fields, and forest. We have given you all the seeds for cultivation, that you may grip the earth as the seeds and roots grip the earth over there. All seeds grow. May you grow as the seeds grow, so that the women may give birth so that there may be lots of palm wine, so that the hunters may kill their prey with their guns. So, another cultural manifestation of maternity and the ramifying ideas of productivity and growth and the analogy between the growth of human beings, the productivity of women, and the productivity of the fields, which is a, a pretty recurrent theme in uh, African belief. Now I want to diverge from the mother and child imagery for just a couple of minutes and talk about images of children in Africa, which are unfortunately often referred to as dolls. And I'll talk about that word in a couple of minutes. The most famous of all these children are these, the Akuaba. Which, as the legends go, originated with a Wednesday-born woman named Akua, who was barren. She went to a diviner, and the diviner said, go to a priest and have a child carved. Treat that child as if it were living. Give it waist beads. Give it, uh, uh, give it um, decorations for the hair and around her neck. Take it to Tano. Take it to a priest. Take it to one of our uh, powerful gods and have it consecrated. And wear that child in your back, in a wrapper, at your back. And in time, Akua, with her ba, ba is the Akan word for child, was walking around the village and other women laughed at her and said, look at Akua, look at Akua, with her child, Akua, ba, Akua's child. Ah, but she became pregnant mm -hmm. and she gave birth to a beautiful female child in this matrilineal culture where female ch children are preferred as the firstborn. And in fact, these akuaba, kuama is the plural, have small breasts as if they were nubile young girls. Occasionally they are given a full-figured treatment here. And here is a shrine to which many of these small figures, these small children, were returned by mothers who had success in giving birth to a healthy baby. The images have a flat head, which is analogous to Kwame Nkrumah's flattened forehead, long flattened forehead, which was in fact 
flattened by his mother when he was a small infant because a long flat forehead is much preferred uh, as an aesthetic feature of Akan or Santi physiognomy. Notice that they all have ringed necks. A ringed neck is a sign of prosperity and it too is a convention for um, good looks and handsomeness. So these akuaba, akuama, um, relate to aesthetics and adulthood. And many of these child figures are in fact young adults, not children at all. But the literature and most people refer to them as dolls. And I don't like that word doll because I think it trivializes these figures, which I consider to be tangible prayers for a, a conception, a successful pregnancy, a safe birth, and a handsome child. All of those things rolled into the ideas surrounding the Akuama. So here we have a Turkana child. Here a, fa a Fali child from northern Ka Cameroon, northern Kenya, northern Cameroon, and northern South Africa, Tsonga. All of them are heavily beaded. And many of these child figures are heavily beaded. What are, be what are these beads all about? They're not necessarily about having a child. They're not necessarily anything to do with a plaything, a doll's plaything. What they are about is prosperity because that's what children provide and that's what uh, beads represent because beads are expensive. Remember, we're talking about people, the folly are, are dreadfully poor people in northern Cameroon. And we're talking about uh, not only beads, but coins. Money sometimes appending. Look at all these beads here. And this one is dressed as a young woman is dressed. A young bride is dressed uh, among the Tsonga. So there, these images are all about motherhood. They are uh, often prepared first by professional sculptors if they're wood, but then they are dressed and cared for and um, they live with their, the, the potential mother, uh, the young woman, until she gives birth. Yes, some of them do become dolls. Some of them are played with. That's well documented. But um, to call them dolls, I think, is, is um, it's a mistake. They really are children, more so than dolls. So what I want to impress you with is some of the cultural differences. Whoops, what happened? I did that myself, sorry. Uh, I don't know how to get it back. Let's see. Um, Can you give me a hand here? Yeah, uh, it's Well, let's, that's right. It's that one. Sorry about that. What do I, what I want to, to um, talk, thank you, talk about for a minute is how different a young mother and her child is, and the culture around the mother and child in Africa as compared with our world. In the first place, a child lives literally with its mother for between two and four years, 24-7. That she does not leave that child for very long unless there's another uh, mother who will be taking care of, of the child. She often lives in a large compound where there are many other women who can step in and take care and sometimes even suckle the young uh, infant. So she will sleep with, with the baby by her side. Most cultures prohibit sex 
intercourse between a husband and wife during the lactation period, which can last up to two and a half, three, and sometimes more than three, three years, uh, which helps to account for polygyny in Africa, but we won't get into that, uh, because that's a, that's a, a, a tough subject. Um, if a woman gives birth today, she may very well be back to work tomorrow or the next day. Um, she doesn't get maternity leave for a few months. Uh, and she is taking care of that child pretty much by herself or maybe with some of her uh, older children to give her a hand. But this is very, very different. The child, a girl child, will live in the mother's domain, often in the mother's separate house, in the compound, until she uh, marries. The boy child will stay with its mother, his mother, until he leaves and is, in a sense, wrested away from uh, the maternal protection um, and nurture at the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whenever uh, he is, uh, begins his initiatory period. So the hugely steep learning curve for a young child is fostered and his learning is through his mother or her mother. Has anybody ever heard of a father tongue? No. All languages are mother tongues, right? Um, so the physical proximity between the child and its mother. There's a wonderful Baule proverb uh, recorded by a friend of mine that says, the mother's back is the best medicine for the child. And oftentimes a child will be at its, on its mother's, tied to its mother's back for hours and hours at a time. Um, brought around to nurse, yes, um, to be changed and so forth. But there's a huge difference between maternity and uh, young infancy in Africa and in our world. So on the screen we have Luba images. Again from Democ oh, I closed my computer because I didn't want to <laughs> mess, mess it up again, and I messed it up again. I don't know what I'm, how I, can you help me <laughs> restore? I thought if I closed the computer, it would still stay on, which it hasn't done. Can you get it? <laughs> Anyway, the images on the screen are Luba from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I have to turn and restart it here. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Technology and I don't get along very well. <laughs> uh, excellent, thank you. I think I'll stay away from the computer. <laughs> um, so we, these are Luba uh, images. They are thrones. They look like stools, but they really are thrones, and they are thrones for kings. There are relatively few maternity images from the Luba, but there are hundreds and hundreds of female sculptures, but only a few dozen uh, images of mothers with children. And I particularly love this one here on this side. I just think that it is stupendous. Here is this adult proportioned small person swallowing its mother's breast. And she's seated placidly, holding the stool support at her, on, on top of her head. These are used, they're sat upon only once at the installation of a king. They are secreted, wrapped in white cloth, uh, and, and, and stored away where nobody knows uh, their location because 
If someone were to steal this stool, that's tantamount to deposing the king. The figure itself represents a female ancestor, and in this matrilineal culture, female ancestors are the most important. And the, uh, the, the, the king, as part of his installation rites, actually sits on the back of a woman, a real woman, as part of the uh, uh, rite of initiation. Um, women are exceptionally important. Women contain and protect the secrets of life among the Luba. This, the, the, uh, the, the female ancestor is a founding ancestor of the particular lineage of that king. And this woman with her scarification is considered the center of memory. And these uh, scars, although they seem to be abstract and non-figurative to us, refer to the Lucasa, which is a memory board that has similar beaded uh, decorations that are historical accounts that are read by soothsayers. And it is said that these um, scars on the woman's torso refer to historical memory and uh, the spirituality that is responsible for <clears throat> uh, the kingdom. There is a saying among the Luba that the king is a woman. So the woman as king is the mother of the people. Um, the, the kings are all males, but they're referred to as the mother of the people because females are so important as represented by these maternity images. There's a chapter on the Akan, and we see on the right a queen mother figure with her uh, feet elevated on a footstool, a nursing mother with a child whose head is larger than hers, which was probably the, a counselor's staff top because there are little pieces of gold leaf attached to it. And here a gold leafed mother and child carved in wood, but with gold leaf, uh, undoubtedly a royal symbol, probably a, a counselor's staff or a shrine figure from the lagoons area of Cote d'Ivoire. There's a chapter as well on the Congo peoples at the mouth of the Congo River with these marvelously refined sculptures as the one on the left of arist an aristocratic woman, quite possibly a, uh, a, undoubtedly a royal. A stone maternity as a grave marker called a mintati, a wooden sculpture of a woman uh, who is about to send her, what, eight, nine-year-old, maybe 10-year-old child off to initiation. So goes the story associated with this one. And here, an ivory maternity, which was a staff top of an important leader or uh, or priest. There is a chapter in the book on the Yoruba. And the Yoruba are the most prolific artists in Africa in the first place. And in the second place, they are the most prolific carvers uh, in ivory and wood of maternity images. There are hundreds and hundreds of maternity images among the Yoruba, and none of them represent deities. And I want to talk about one of my 
or my second pet peeve, the first being the doll that I spoke of earlier, and the second is the designation of fertility goddess for every African sculpture that shows a woman suckling a child. The knee-jerk response is, oh, that must be a fertility goddess. Well, yes, sometimes it is a goddess. Sometimes it has to do with fertility. Quite often it has to do with fertility, but it has to do with lots of other things as well. And many of the images represent worshipers of deities or queen mothers who are not deities, ancestors who are quasi-deities. They are certainly respected as spirits, spirits of the dead, but they're not deities per se. So here we have a woman on the left who is holding, first of all, wearing a child, carrying a child on her back in the, in the um, conventional position. And in front of her, she's carrying a calabash, which is for the Yoruba symbol of the world. The upper part of the calabash is the upper world. The center of the calabash is this world. And the lower part of the calabash is um, <clears throat> the, the uh, underworld. This woman is carrying, she is the guardian of secrets. Uh, women and mothers among the Yoruba are exceptionally powerful. Um, most African cultures are heavily paternalistic. And this is probably true of the Yoruba, but less so among the Yoruba than among many other different peoples. Uh, this image here is a divination cup, very, very old, heavily weathered, with a, a unique iconography of a woman kissing her child, um, and a tin cup that replaces the wooden cup that uh, broke off. Um, this holds the 16 sacred palm nuts that are used by diviners to uncover uh, lost articles, predict the future, and so forth. The diviner being a soothsayer, a, uh, a, a wise person who can uncover secrets. But the woman is exceptionally important as the holder of the mysteries and secrets of the world. And those secrets, of course, are within her womb, her ability to conceive and give birth to a child. This is the ultimate secret uh, that women possess. There's a chapter on masquerades in the book as well. This one is uh, a Gelide masquerader from Yoruba country, the same culture we were just looking at in southwestern Nigeria. A mask worn by a male in an entirely male <coughs> cult, but a masquerading organization that is devoted to the mothers. And the mothers among the Yoruba are older women, past childbearing, who in their advanced age gain power. Remember that many African cultures are gerontocracies, the rule by the older uh, generation. Most chiefs and kings are elders. And elders have a powerful role in political and social affairs in Africa. <clears throat> so this dance by the Gelade Society um, presents masquerades of lots of different characters, foreigners, local people, local professions, diviners, um, merchants, and so forth. But all the dances are in honor of the mothers paying homage to them, honoring, placating the mothers, so that they will shine their beneficence upon the people and not turn into witches, which can affect the family and the community in an adverse way. Because if you wrong the mothers, they can turn against you. So be careful of older women. <laughs> they can be very powerful. <laughs> And on the left, we have the Chihuahua masquerade among the Bamana people. A male 
on the left and a female masquerader. Now, as far as I know, baby antelopes do not jump onto the backs of their mothers. But they do in the Chihuahua masquerade, which is actually the dancers of these uh, headdresses are champion farmers among the Bamana. And they get, after they have uh, won the competitions in the previous year and the next year, they are allowed to dance these masks. And the male and female, this is, remember, the culture where Fadenya and Badenya, father-childness and mother-childness, um, the two figures, male and female, may not be separated. And their dance is uh, quite highly sexualized, reports tell us. And of course, the dance is about the productivity of the fields, but obviously it's about the productivity of the human race as well. Now the final chapter of the book moves away from the first 10. There are 11 chapters in the book. The first 10 are about what we often refer to as traditional African arts. Almost entirely made by men with the male gaze, if you will, which glorifies maternity, which idealizes the mother with her child, which does not show any blemish, anything to do with the difficulties of childbirth, uh, of uh, rearing children in a heavily paternalistic culture. But in the last 50, 60, 70 years, and particularly in South Africa where women artists, many of the mothers, have made imagery of mothers and children, there's a paradigm shift towards maternal subjectivity away from idealizing and glorifying maternity towards telling it like it is. Uh, talking about racial problems. And Penny Siopas, the artist who had this photograph made in South Africa, shows herself in a, it's called Comrade Mother, by the way, and she's wearing a helmet uh, as if she is at war with apartheid. This uh, image was, was made in uh, 1994, which is the year Nelson Mandela was uh, elected president of South Africa and the year that apartheid was dismantled in South Africa. She has her hand on the head of her son Alexander and on the head of a store mannequin. This Yoruba royal house post has one child on one knee, another child on the other. This Akan terracotta, royal terracotta, has a child uh, on either thigh. So there's a superficial uh, similarity between these three uh, images, and that's what I've tried to do in the final chapter. I've juxtaposed the more traditional on the left side of the page with the modern on the right. And I'm only going to show you two of these, but there are a dozen uh, or more in the book. What is this image all about? Well, we're not entirely sure, and Penny Siopas, the artist, hasn't told us, but uh, it's certainly about race. Uh, it's certainly about apartheid. It's uh, wondering, perhaps on the part of the artist, wondering about her complicity as a white person in the suppression and the exploitation of black people in South African society. Then in the very foreground, there is another store mannequin head with a mottled face, both dark and light, puzzling. But the whole image is, I mean, she's wearing a see-through dress. Why? Uh, so she's sexualizing herself in this uh, image as well. Um,
Then as a final image, we have a photograph by David Goldblatt on the right, recently deceased major photographer in South Africa, um, juxtaposed with a 17th century Madonna and child. And Goldblatt photographed this woman in front of a circular window in the living room of her employer, who happened to be a collector of African art, as you can see in the walls behind. So that she's wearing, in a sense, metaphorically a halo, which we see in actuality in the 17th century Ethiopian icon. <coughs> Goldblatt's caption to this image is important, and I'm going to read it if I can find it <laughs> in my notes. Oh, rats. I've done it again. Oop, no, 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 back. Thank you. <laughs> Victoria Kobokana in her employer's dining room with her son Sfiso and her daughter Annika. Johannesburg, June 1999. This is Goldblatt's caption. Victoria died of AIDS on 13 December 1999. Sfiso died of AIDS on 12 January 2000. Annika died of AIDS in May 2000. So we have the tragic realism of a portrait photograph on the right and a conventionalized religious image on the left and a shift from the glorification of the mother of God and her child, Christ, to women at risk. And women are at risk in Africa and have been at risk in Africa, continue to be at risk in Africa from disease, from poverty, from domestic violence, from warfare, from any of the afflictions of human society, women and children are going to take the brunt. The guys are going to get enough food, but the women and children are going to get the leftovers for the most part, not the, uh, not the, the, um, the best parts of the uh, animal or the food. So to sum up, Maternity is at the center of semantic, metaphorical, and philosophical elaborations. As a concept and image, maternity is transformative, generative, a cultural construct that varies widely in time and space and embodies nurture, of course, education, growth, language, regeneration, fruitfulness of field and family, and also protection, morality, prosperity, and beauty. Thank you. Be happy to answer questions. You want to turn the lights on for us? If there are any questions. <clears throat> yes? It was a photograph from the Ivory Coast. The uh, figures all looked like they had uh, pointed teeth. Can you talk about that? Um, well, not infrequently, teeth were filed or chipped. Uh, this was an aesthetic decision. Um, N not, it wasn't, it wasn't done for eating purposes, it was done for aesthetic purposes, uh, mostly, as far as I'm aware.
Any other questions or comments? Yes. I used to know uh, dolls. I'm sorry? The dolls. Yes. Ashanti dolls. Yes. You call them differently. I, I call them, I, I call them uh, children. Yeah, but don't they have the name of Ashanti? Yes, they are Ashanti. They're from the Ashanti people. Ah, uh, all right. Yeah. And they are referred to as dolls frequently, but I, I prefer the word child. Yeah, I know that. Okay. Yeah, no, no. They, this one is definitely Asante. Mm -hmm. This one is Fali, by the way, from northern Cameroon. Very heavily beaded. And I brought in a, an Anyi uh, maternity to, to show the contrast between the simplicity and abstract nature of the children and the full uh, idealization of the mother and child um, among many peoples. I also brought some couple of gold weights, which are brass sculptures, miniature brass sculptures, two of them uh, mothers and children. This one that I showed actually and didn't refer to in the slide is a mother carrying a load on her head and a child at her back. And the proverb that goes with that is, it is an ideal woman who can carry her market stall on her head and her child at her back. <laughs> this also uh, reminds us that the woman who goes to market with her market stall on her head is also with her child, again, 24-7. Uh, and you go to an African market and the women will have their kids right there with them for the most part. Yes? You, you've talked about some of the women, the female deities being herbalists or gathering medicine. What, what role do women have as, as doctors or medicines? It varies from culture to culture. Many, many women are diviners and doctors, herbalists and so forth. Um, in the book, there's a, a calabash, that uh, a picture of a, of a calabash, big calabash with medicines inside it, and a whole bunch of small calabashes around it. And the big calabash is called the mother of medicine among a, one of the peoples in Tanzania, sent, sent to me by Barbara Johnson, who's done that research in that area. And the little calabashes are her children, and they are being prepared to go out into the world with junior diviners and doctors. But the, the, the mother of medicine in the hands of, of the senior herbalist and doctor um, has prepared these medicines in the smaller calabashes. And so among the Sanufo, for example, most of the diviners are female. Um, it varies enormously from culture to culture. Uh, I don't think the, the most Yoruba diviners and doctors are males. Um, Igbo, mostly males. But lots of cultures have female doctors and diviners, herbalists. Are the women the ones that assist in childbirth? Or yeah, most cultures um, prohibit men from being involved in childbirth at all. And in fact, many cultures have houses that are devoted to the women by themselves. It is their domain and their husband is welcome only by invitation. Can you take one more question? Yes, the back. The very first slide, I think it's the Mabari. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes. White is the color of purity and goodness among the Igbo. When I first started teaching at UCSB in 68, I had a couple of black students who said, ah, this is the influence of white people. And I said, no, you know, let's give Igbo people credit for painting their major deity the color they wanted to paint her. This is an honorific, painting her with a light-skinned light face. Um, and ha has little to do with 
with the colonial uh, uh, presence of the British. But interestingly, the Igbo and probably quite a number of other African peoples, both men and women prefer to marry someone with lighter skin than they have. Now, why this is, I don't know. Do you find that to be true, Linda, Tom? Have you seen that ever? Not, not so much. In you haven't seen it in, in your, your part of Africa? Well, it's certainly true among the Igbo. Um, and I've heard it to be true uh, in other places. So thank you again very much. I, I'll hang around and answer other questions for those of you who want to, want to come up and look at the pieces. And stuff. And I think there are copies of the book in the bookstore, if you're interested. Um, I'd be happy to sign it if you want to buy one, bring it back over here. Or come and look at the book if you want to just look at it. <laughs> Hey, that's on.